Go ahead. Okay, I'm going to start by quoting something that you probably all read in high school or were supposed to read in high school. Friends, Romans, countrymen, lend me your ears. Does that sound familiar? Where is it from? Right, Mark Antony's speech in Julius Caesar. And I bring this up because uh, Mark Antony says, after Caesar's death, friends, Romans, countrymen, lend me your ears. I come to bury Caesar, not to praise him. The evil that men do oft lives, lives after them, but the good is oft interred within their bones. Mark Antony said that, but then he went on to tell a completely different story in his speech. He said that he came to bury Caesar, not to praise him. The entire rest of his speech was praise of Caesar. He was his friend. They shared Cleopatra. Um, <laughs> but uh, the entire rest of the speech was, like I said, praise for Caesar. So, and the only reason I bring this up, first of all, because it's a good speech that Shakespeare wrote, but secondly, is because you don't always know what someone is going to say. And so you have to be alert. You have to always, from the very beginning of the speech to the end, be alert. In uh, covering a meeting or event, I believe you all have this either uh, electronically or the paper copy from Professor Schaefer. He says to, somewhere on there, it says to try to get an advanced copy of the speech. Very important. Get an advanced copy. There's almost always an advanced copy out there. And then what I do is take notes right on the advanced copy because the speaker will often digress or add something or, de or skip over something in the advanced copy. And when you put it in print, you have to make sure that your report is accurate. And if Mike Bush didn't say something or he added something that should be, and you think it's worthy enough to put in your story, then it's something that you need to be cognizant of. Um, let's see, speeches. In covering a speech, you have to, like I said, be alert. You have to listen for the most important thing the speaker says. And that means you've got to listen to the speech from beginning to end, because you have no idea if that's going to come early on in the speech or later in the speech. Back in 1968, President Lyndon Johnson gave a speech to the nation. Uh, in which it lasted, as I recall, about 20 minutes. And he went on and on and on uh, talking about the efforts he had made to try to secure peace in Vietnam, all the while we were sending more and more troops and bombers over there. Uh, at the very, very end of the speech, Johnson, you can see him turn away from the camera. Apparently, his wife, Lady Bird, was off to the side. And he said, therefore, I will not seek, nor will I accept, my party's nomination for re-election to the presidency. And in the next day, in all of the newspapers and on all the TV stations, that's the only thing that was hardly mentioned. All of this other talk he gave about peace was almost irrelevant, because the important part of that speech was his last line about, I am not going to run again. I've had enough of this crap which is essentially what he was saying. Uh, and was that on, there was no advanced copy, right? On the speech? Uh, the, Was the Washington Press may have had it, but it may have been embargoed. Embargoed means you cannot publish something or broadcast it until a certain hour. I'm working on a story right now that's uh, embargoed until next Tuesday about fracking causing more earthquakes in northern New Mexico and southern Colorado. But we can't publish this story until, like I said, Tuesday or if like Monday afternoon, but the paper doesn't come out on Monday afternoon. So. so so you shouldn't cheat. You shouldn't just, if you've got an advanced copy of a speech, you better listen to the speech because they might change things. Things might get thrown at. Absolutely, like the LBJ speech, the yeah. Johnson speech. I don't think Lady Bird knew he was going to say that. He pro they had probably talked ad infinitum about how awful it was to be president with that war going on, because I think he sort of felt like he was roped into it. Uh, but 
you know, it was a fact. It was going on. But anyway, I, I don't think she knew that he was going to say he wasn't going to run again or that he would not accept the nomination. Another, let me say something again about list, being there for the whole thing. Um, covering a meeting, I'm sort of digressing now. I was going to talk about speeches and then meetings, but I'll talk about meetings. It's very good to get to a meeting on time and to stay for the whole thing. You never know what's going to be said at the last minute. When I was working in uh, Southern California, I very often had to attend late night city council meetings. And very often, round about midnight, when almost everyone had left, a counselor would say something that was newsworthy, sometimes significantly newsworthy. And the other reporters almost always had always had left by then. And I was still a diehard, and I hung around. And it gave me good stories that they didn't get, that the competition didn't have. Uh, in LA, there was more than one newspaper, which was good. Uh, so try to stay, if you can, for the entire meeting. I would always have to put in my story the meeting, which lasted past midnight, because, or else my wife wouldn't have believed me that I was out <laughs> all these nights uh, at city council meetings, exciting places to be. Uh, I've only been to one or two city council meetings in my whole life when I wasn't working. Uh, it's, frankly, most people don't go to city council meetings, and I dare say, I bet none of you have ever been to one. I could be wrong. But uh, most people don't like them. But if you're working, they can be very interesting because you're attuned to what's, what the subject matter is, hopefully. You've gone over the agenda. And like I say, uh, it's part of your job to know what's going on, and then you have to write about it also. And you want to sound, you don't want to sound like a dunce when you start writing. Duh, I was at the meeting, but I don't know what happened or nothing happened. You have to find the most important thing that happened during that meeting, and that's what you focus your story on. Same thing with a speech. What did the speaker say? Like with the LBJ speech, the Lyndon Johnson speech, the most important thing that man said that night was he was not going to run, and he wouldn't accept the nomination. And that's what you have to look for in a speech. Another famous speech starts off with four score and seven years ago. Our fathers brought forth on this continent a new nation, conceived in liberty and dedicated to the proposition that all men are created equal. You all know that's the Gettysburg Address. What was it in the Gettysburg Address given by Abraham Lincoln that was most important? What was the most important element of his speech? It may not have been a direct quote. The entire speech was beautifully written, the most gorgeous piece of writing I've ever seen. It brings tears to my eyes today. But what was it? It was his overall message. And the overall message was that these men shall not have died in vain, that their legacy will live, and that the country, and the very end of his speech, shall have a new birth of freedom, and that nation under God what was it, the, the nation under God? Nation for the people. For the people, by the, of, people. by the people and of the people, or right. some version of that, shall not perish from the earth. That was the most important thing Lincoln said, although the entire speech built up to that. The entire speech was very short. I think it had like less than 300 words. It was a very brief speech. It was given outdoors. It was November 19, 1963, in Gettysburg, Gettysburg, Pennsylvania, which is why it's called the Gettysburg Address. Uh, but it was, like I said, a very beautiful, beautiful speech that, by some accounts, he wrote on the train while he was heading up to Gettysburg from Washington on the back of an envelope. Uh, so when you're, looking f when you're listening to a speech, the most important thing to do, and again, I say the most important thing, is to listen, to be alert. You want to hear not only the entire speech that the person is giving, but what did they say? What was most important? And that's going to be the lead of your story. Always, that is going to be the lead of your story. One thing you do not want to write is that Mike Bush gave a speech Tuesday morning to a journalism class at UNM. Who cares? That was old news. We had decided that a couple of days ago. Maybe you all knew that. I don't know. 
What did Mike Bush say? That's what's important, not the fact that he was there giving a speech. Okay. When uh, Martin Luther King Jr. gave his I Have a Dream speech in 1963 in Washington, everyone knew that Dr. King was going to be the keynote speaker. And so to say Dr. King gave a speech, even if you say he gave a wonderful speech in front of the Lincoln <laughs> Memorial on that summer day in August uh, 1963, well, that's old news. Everyone knew that was going to happen. What was news was what Dr. King said. And Dr. King's speech was considerably longer than the Gettysburg Address. But what did he say? What was the most important thing he said? And I think generally, the news stories picked up one sentence where he said that he longed to live in a country where his kids would not be judged by the color of their skin, but rather by the content of their character. That was essentially the gist of what Dr. King's speech, I Have a Dream, was. He wanted to be in that kind of country where race was basically irrelevant and character was most important. And, and as I recall, he did a fair amount at the end where he really worked in the I Have a Dream. A lot of that was ad lib. It was moving off of what the, the comments he had prepared. But he well, exactly. He, he, he had spoken a lot, so he was a great speaker. Has anyone ever heard the entirety of the I Have a Dream speech? Just a couple of you. I would urge you to, when you get a chance, it's in the library, listen to it. It's a very powerful speech. Dr. King had a booming bar baritone. It was uh, delivered beautifully. And, when it, and it was sort of like building in momentum. I have a dream that this would happen. I have a dream that that would happen. I have a dream that we will live this way. He went on and it built up to a, finally a crescendo. And at the very end of his speech, which he often did, he would get, issue the last word and he wouldn't stand there and bow or wave. He would just turn around and walk away. That was his style. Um, any questions at all about speeches? Uh, yeah. So it was like... I like questions, by the way. Go ahead. Um, as, be, as future communication workers, um, if you, and let, let's say you're involved in, the, in a press um, operations for, for a person, a, let's say like the president, let's just go big. Um, what, would, you, would you be responsible for, write, for writing their speeches? Or no, I'm not, I'm not uh, you might very well. It depends on who, how important the person is. Someone like the president of the United States has a whole staff and office full of speechwriters. And there's the lead speechwriter. Ultimately, the president is the one who, if he has time, he will review it and make changes on it. But like I say, there could be a whole staff. If you're the mayor of Rio Rancho, you might not have a speechwriter. Then again, you may. I don't know if the mayor does there or not. Mayor Barry does. Um, but again, Mayor Barry goes over everything that is handed to him if he has time. Uh, often at meetings, just a second, often at meetings, you listen to a series of mini speeches, little speeches. These people, uh, chances are, have written them themselves. They might be ad libbing, but uh, again, you cover it just like a speech. Yes, sir? Um, you answered my question. Okay. Any other questions? No? Actually, oh. one of uh, Barry's uh, two people who write speeches for him was in your seat about eight years ago. Oh, really? Yeah. Right. She's moved on now. Who's that? Uh, Brianna? No, she's there. OK. Yeah, she's the, uh, I think she's, they're going to name her director of communications. Oh, cool. Right now, she's the acting director of communications. Brianna Anderson. Mm -hmm. Interestingly, the mayor's spokesperson, chief spokesperson person is Brianna Anderson. The district attorney's spokesperson is Kayla Anderson. And UNM's chief spokesperson is Diane Anderson. They're not related, but they're all, named, all women named Anderson. So, so go for Change me. your name if you want a good job. <laughs> <laughs> uh, what was like, the most profound speech you've ever sat in on? You know, that's a really good question, and I think the honest answer is I don't know. Uh, as far as profound goes, I've, 
I was watched the Lyndon Johnson speech on TV, and it wasn't profound until he got to the very end of it. There were, during the Vietnam War, and at other times, I've heard profound speeches. Who's the, uh, Susan Sarandon, I heard her give a speech right before the uh, US invaded Iraq. This was in New York City. My daughter and I went to uh, a demonstration, an anti-war demonstration, and Susan Sarandon gave a very good speech, a very profound speech. It was brief, maybe five minutes long, uh, and she was outside, and it was sometimes kind of difficult to hear with the PA systems and the crowd noise. But it was, uh, she went over several reasons why she felt, and I agreed, that the United States should not be going to war in Iraq. Uh, afterwards, President Bush said he wasn't going to listen to a focus group, and we went to war. I think he probably regrets that decision. And I think that he feels he was pulled into it by Vice President Cheney. Okay. Any other questions? And if you want to find out about what the pu what public thinks, then you can go to polls. And Pew, uh, Pew Research Center does polls on just about everything. So if an issue's been around for a month, they've polled on it usually for a couple months. And yeah. that can be, can you include outside information when you're writing? Yes, you can, as background information. If, for example, the, say the president's giving a speech and the president says the earth is flat, well then, and he means it, then you can go back and grab something out of Galileo or Columbus or someone and, to prove that he was in, either incorrect or lying. Or he's a good politician and most of the American public believes the earth is flat. Right. <laughs> No, but by, by all means, you can use outside information. And thank you for mentioning that or asking that. By all means, use outside information when it's necessary. Uh, for example, if you were writing about the uh, Lincoln's Gettysburg Address speech, you would probably have to say something about the Battle of Gettysburg. Lincoln didn't mention it other than in passing, saying the men who fought on these fields. Uh, but you need to say that it was July, I think it was 2nd, 3rd, and 4th of that year that these, this tremendous battle had taken place and that, what was it, 48,000 people became casualties in it. So you have to put this information in the story as context. <coughs> you always provide context to the reader. Maybe the reader didn't know anything about the Battle of Gettysburg. Back then, I believe a lot of people probably didn't know about it. Uh, or hadn't heard very much about it. And so you need to provide that context, that background information for your report. Same thing with meetings. Uh, before the event, Professor Schaefer says, go over the agenda of the meeting before it starts. Always do that if you can. Uh, cities, universities, the Board of Regents, they all publish agendas. And you can get a copy. Uh, you, you all can get a copy of the Board of Regents agenda. They're meeting Friday, Friday morning in uh, the Student Union building. You can get a copy from Mallory Revere. I know she's going to hate me if 40 people come rushing in to ask for a copy of the agenda. But she's a wonderful person, a very nice person, and she will be as helpful as she can possibly be. Uh, but you need to know a little bit not only about the meeting and the time and go over the agenda, but who's on the board? Who are the regents? How many, does anyone know how many regents there are? There are seven, okay? Seven regents, including one student, okay? The others are all either, uh, they're all political appointees, but they are, they can be leaders in uh, business or in education or whatever, okay? But know who these, uh, the board members are and you also need to know who the principals are who are going to speak at the meeting. Chances are good if he's in town. President Bob Frank will talk to the regents. He will be there. The provost, who is the provost of this school? Shout out his name. Chowky. Thank you. Chowky Abdallah is his last name. 
former engineering professor, he will speak. He's a great speaker. He speaks with an accent. He was uh, born and raised in Lebanon. But he's a brilliant man, and he's a good speaker, um, colorful speaker. Other people will likely have their parts to say, too. The, uh, what's his name? The leader of the Health Sciences Center, Paul Roth. Until yesterday, he may have been the highest paid employee of uh, UNM. Um, and so all of these different, a lot, a lot of the vice presidents, UNM has a lot of vice presidents. Many of them will speak. The uh, financial experts working for the university will speak. But you try to learn who these people are. And if you're going to quote them, you have to get the name of their, the spelling of their names correct. It's incumbent on you to do that. So even if the guy's name is Mike Bush, and you write Mike Bush in your story, well, maybe I smell, spell Bush, B-U-S-C-H. So you've got to find out. A good way to find out on, and to have the correct spelling is to ask for a business card. If people have them, they, that's why they have them, to give out. And then not only do you have their phone number, but you also have the correct spelling of their name. Uh, and it's good to have the phone number, because then you can go back to get something clarified if you didn't <coughs> understand it, or if it happened too quickly, or you couldn't hear for some reason. Yeah. OK, you, you understand that's my question. But is it appropriate to say after a meeting, you know, if there's something in your notes you're like, ah, oh, that doesn't make that much sense. Is it okay to go back and, and call them, email them, and say, hey, Absolutely. You should. Okay. You should do that. And they appreciate it, because they don't want to be misquoted or sound like they're babbling. They want to sound like intelligent, like they know what's going on. Maybe even during the meeting, after they sit down, after they finish speaking, you can go over and say, excuse me, I'm Mike Bush. I'm with the journal. And did you say oh, blah, 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 something like that. Don't interrupt the meeting, but you, or maybe at the end of the meeting. Yes? What if you can get their number directly if it's an assistance number that's on there that picks up? When you need something clarified, would the assistant be able to do that for you? They might be able to. Hopefully, they'll be able to. If you cannot clarify something and you're slightly confused by it, don't put it in your story. Because if you guess, you're going to guess wrong. <laughs> Believe me, I don't. I've tried several times. And you go, don't always be wrong. So don't ever try to guess. But always do whatever you can to get clarification. If you're talking to uh, someone here at UNM, for example, or you're listening to someone at UNM speak and you can't get in touch with that person, then you call the communications office, Diane Anderson's office. And either she or someone in the office will be able to help you. If they don't know the answer, it's their job to find out the answer and get back with you. Okay. And there's some good people working over there. There's uh, Professor Schaefer's friend, Carolyn Gonzalez, Karen Wentworth, Steve Carr. There's a lot of good people working there, Cinnamon Blair. So just keep that in mind. Most big organizations have a communications department. And one of their jobs is to get information to inquiring minds, okay, or inquiring reporters or people covering the event for whatever reason. Okay. You work, Matt, question? Yeah. You work for the Albuquerque Journal, which is the biggest news organization in New Mexico. So when Mike Bush calls, people are likely to answer. But um, do you have any strategies for them when they call, uh, what, how they should try and get a little bit of journalistic respect and get the call back as best as possible? That can be tough. It can be very tough. I remember when I worked for the LA Times, I was at a press conference one day. And the, re the speaker was talking to several reporters. I came in. I was a little late, uh, which you're not supposed to be. But I came in, and I'm from the Los Angeles Times, which was the biggest paper in LA. And immediately, the speaker just turned to me and it just ignored everyone else. It was, she was so blatant, it was a woman, it was so blatant that I was embarrassed. I, if any, anyone should have been left out, it should have been me because I was late, right? But that's the pe people gravitate towards the power. And in this case, it's the uh, Albuquerque Journal. 
Uh, the most important thing you have going for you, especially as a novice, is your reputation. Your reputation of accuracy and honesty and fairness. Okay? And that reputation, you start building it right away and it follows you forever. So don't ever take things out of context. If you take something I said out of context, I'm never, if I speak to you again, I might lie to you. Okay? Or I'm, I may not ever speak to you again. I'm going to be angry. No one wants to be misquoted or misrepresented. Mm -hmm. So, uh, but that's all, about all I can say to answer the question is to be honest and fair to people. Don't take things out of context. And pretty quickly, your reputation will start to build. When I came here a year ago to UNM, Chowki Abdullah, Bob Frank, they didn't know who I was. They looked at me warily. You know, who is this guy? He's replacing Astrid Galvan, who was pretty good. We could maybe manipulate her a little bit. Uh, but anyway, I had to build a reputation when I got here. That they may have done some checking on my background. I don't know. But uh, your reputation is the most important thing you have. And I'm talking about your professional reputation. Your personal reputation can also get involved in that picture. So you've got to be careful how you act when you're not working also. Uh, this guy who was uh, arrested recently for drunk driving is a good example of that. Mark Saavedra, he was a lobbyist for the university. A great guy, a great guy, an excellent lobbyist, brought all kinds of money from the legislature to, from Santa Fe to UNM. But Sadly, he was a drunk. Well, he is a drunk. I don't know. He's supposed to be going through rehab now. And it caught up with him. He, had, he was, I think, 42 years old. He had three DUIs. And that means he probably drank and drive hundreds of times to get caught those three times. So you've got to keep your personal life clean, too. If you have any uh, skeletons in the closet, make sure they stay in the closet. Yeah? So before you interview somebody, Uh, you don't have to. <laughs> because if you don't know anything about them, how can you know what kind of questions you can ask? Well, if it's uh, the provost, for example. The provost is the highest uh, ranking faculty member on a campus. And so you know that about Chowki Abdullah. If you have time, look something up. How long has he been at the university? Where was he before? What was he doing before he became provost? Uh, in this case, the guy was from Lebanon. I think that's, I probably got that from his webpage. Or maybe he's mentioned it to me in conversations. But you just, uh, if you have time, get all the information you can. But very often you won't have time. Or you might walk into a meeting and lo and behold, there's seven regents. The, my, when I went to my first regents meeting, I didn't know how many there were. But there were seven. And so afterwards, I wrote all their names down. Uh, their names are not listed on the agenda. But I wrote all their names down, and I went back, and I looked at the UNM website, and I looked up each one personally, just so I would know a little bit about them, because I knew I would have to be, I would be dealing with them for the, at least for the coming months, maybe even years. How many questions years. do we need to elaborate to write, I see, uh, 600 words? Uh, I can't answer that question. It depends on what the speaker has said. Um, if you're writing a speech, say about, uh, say, let's go back to the Lyndon Johnson speech. Like I said, he went on for about 20 minutes before he announced he wasn't running for office again. Uh, what, what did he say? And you might have to check every single fact he gave you because, as we all know, politicians, like a lot of people, tend to be, if not liars, then they tend to exaggerate or to leave things or to omit things, leave things out of the story. And so you need to ask questions. Well, President Johnson, what about uh, the validity of the Gulf of Tonkin resolution? You might have to ask those kind of questions. But in a case like uh, Lincoln's speech, the Gettysburg Address, there's really very few questions you could ask, I think. And I think the same might be true for Martin Luther King's I Have a Dream speech. There's really not too many questions you can ask. You might want to find out, well, Dr. King, how old are you? 
uh, where were you born, that sort of thing, which you can also get online or in the literature. But uh, it, it depends entirely on the situation. Uh, like I said about politicians, you got to be cynical to a point. Uh, they, to a person, can't be completely trusted. And they say things, a lot of politicians are very honest, but they will say things or they will omit information to make themselves look better. And if you notice that they don't want to answer like a certain question, what do you have to do? Go to the next person or you have to insist? Well, you can insist all you want. They don't have to answer. Oh, they don't uh, no, they don't have to even talk to you if they don't want to. We have freedom of speech. But uh, it's good to persist a little bit. You don't want to make a pain in the neck of yourself. Right? But you, if you, you could say, uh, Mr. Speaker, you know, I ask you, you you're, avo you're avoiding my question. And they'll say, oh, no, the real question is, that's a trick politicians often use. You ask a question and they say, well, the real question here is blah, blah, blah. And then they go on to give their little canned speech. And it's up to you to say, no, uh, Representative Luhan Grisham, that's not what I asked you. But like I said, you can only ask the same question a couple of times, two or three times. After that, it becomes pretty clear that they're not going to answer. And then you might go on to another question. Now, that does not stop you if you don't get the information from saying in your story, uh, the representative declined to answer or refused to answer questions about his past or something like that. Okay. A lot of times um, there'll be litigation involved and people are told not to talk. So I think it's, it, it's very important that you provide a context for the refusal to provide inf information about something. Um, it, a lot of times I'll see students to try and be aggressive, they'll write uh, uh, so-and-so refused to answer. Well, so-and-so was told by the, was given a court order not to speak about something, a gag order. So uh, it may be very responsible. I think it's important to include the context of the, it, the refusal. And there's even a name for keeping it, trying to ask the same question over and over again is 20 questions, right? That's, you, somebody doesn't answer your first question a certain way, so you rephrase your question, then you rephrase it, and you rephrase it. After a while, you figure they don't want to answer. Right. What Professor Schaefer says about a gag order is very true. If a judge tells someone not to say something, that person better not say something, or they'll find themselves in court and being uh, found uh, in contempt of court. There's also a lot of organizations will not speak about personnel issues or legal matters. And even if you, when you go to a, your meeting, if, if you sh say you should go to the Board of Regents meeting, there's a closed session, an executive session, where the Regents kick everyone out except for the people they want in there, like the President or the Provost, and they'll discuss personnel matters. Why is someone being fired? Why, is, why are we hiring this person? What's their background? Why are we giving this person a raise? Very often, I think, they, they uh, really extend the definition of personnel matters a bit farther than they should, a bit further than they should, but that's up to them. Okay? And chances are they will not talk about what goes on behind closed doors. Now, if you've been covering an agency for a while, maybe you've become particularly close to one of the regents, and that regent may get you to swear that you're not going to say where you got some information, but, and they may feed you some information. It may be off the record, which means you cannot use it unless you could get it from somewhere else, but, or just for background information. But uh, again, it's your reputation. If this person can trust you and they know you're not going to uh, stab them in the back, then they will tell you things that they ordinarily would not tell a reporter or a writer or someone covering this event. Mm -hmm. And if they don't answer a question that I think is really important, uh, can you write in my report that they didn't want to answer that question? 
Well, maybe they wanted to, but they felt they couldn't. You've got to be careful how you write that. You can, say, you can say they did not answer the question of why uh, so many Albuquerque police officers are shooting people these days or in the you know, last couple of years. You, you just have to be very careful of that. Remember, it's their right not to speak, just like it's their right to speak. And so you have to respect that right also. But yes, by all means, you can say that. If, if you feel that the question is important and they haven't answered it, then they should. A good example is talking about uh, police shootings might be something like, uh, was the suspect armed or the dead person armed? Or did he, he or she threaten the officer? And that's a very valid question. Uh, they might say something like, well, I can't answer that because there's an, invest an ongoing investigation. But meanwhile, they answer every other question about that's involved in this ongoing investigation. And it's, uh, I guess, incumbent on you to persist a little bit to pressure them to try to get them to talk. But that's a question that I believe the public has a right to know. Was this guy, uh, I forget his first name, Mr. Boyd, the one who was killed in the foothills, was he armed? Did he threaten the cops? That was pertinent to the story. And so ask the questions. If they don't answer, then like I say, it's their right, but it's up to you to ask the questions also. Okay. Anyone else? When covering a meeting, usually there's any number of things that happen in a meeting. Okay. So you're probably going to pick what you think is, as a journalist, as is the most important or interesting for, the, for your readers to know, right? Mm -hmm. uh, what do you do with the other things that happened at the meeting? Well, it depends. Uh, generally, a newspaper like the Journal doesn't care about the other things that happened at the meeting. Uh, but in a lot of newspapers, a lot of uh, TV stations will say something like, uh, at at the end of their report about the most important thing, uh, the newscaster will say, oh, and the council also decided to adopt a, a measure on new taxes. They also decided to uh, do this or do that or do that. Newspapers, we often use bullets when that happens toward the end of the story. In other business or in other action, the council did this, they did that, they did that. Just one short one or two sentences reports on what else they did at the meeting. Before I go to a meeting, I try to, I, well, it depends, but it, let's say go back to the Board of Regents or the City Council. I get a copy of the agenda and I go over it with a highlighter. This is what I want to be especially attentive to. These two things, I might put a little red star next to something. I just did this yesterday. I'm going to be out of town Friday, but the Regents are meeting, so I don't know if the newspaper is going to send someone else there. But I gave my editors a copy of the agenda with my highlighted notations, just in case they want to send someone else. But like I said, I don't know if they will. But whenever you have the time, always do that. It's really good to be as prepared as you possibly can be. Okay. Uh, in covering the report, the meeting, again, just like a speech, what's the most important thing that happened? It may be something that's not even on the agenda. When uh, going back to uh, the 19th century, if you were uh, an entertainment reporter out to cover a play at Ford's Theater in Washington, what happened that night at Ford's Theater? The play was irrelevant, right, when President Lincoln was assassinated. The play, it really didn't matter. But what you would write is a, a, a story about John Wilkes Booth uh, shooting the president. So often, I shouldn't say often, occasionally the most important thing is not even on the agenda. So that's why you have to be alert. Okay. You are most interested, just a sec, most interested in things involving money, if it's not too dull, any unusual uses of money. Crimes, celebrities, unfortunately, but these sorts of things that people are interested in hearing about. Yes, ma'am. Oh, um, I was going to ask that you said the Board of Regents meeting is on Friday. 
Yeah. And that's um, a valid thing for our assignment, right? Can you cover that? Yeah, there's a list here, uh, places to find events. Uh, I don't know if that's on here, but uh, that, that, would, that, would, that would be at the, on the university calendar, the Board of Regents. Right. And it's, it, it starts at 9 o'clock in the morning, and it's in the Student Union Building. I think Ballroom B, if I'm correct. Uh, they have cookies and snacks there, too, <laughs> which always helps. <laughs> Sometimes when you go to press conferences, they'll uh, have donuts out there. The pe these people, when they have a press conference, they're trying to get information out to the public, and they want you to write. They really want you to be there. Uh, and so they'll feed you. There'll be danishes or donuts and coffee and things like that. But that's a different kind of coverage. When you go to a press conference, it's different than going to a meeting. A meeting is something that's going to take place whether the, you're there or not. But if no reporters show up at a press conference, which sometimes happens, or sometimes just one, then uh, the press conference has been a failure. Yeah? So when we are covering a meeting or an event, uh, we just need to write the most important details or everything. Well, it depends on, you need to talk to your editors, your bosses first, your news director first. What do they want? If, and if they tell you, say you're a newspaper reporter, and they say all we have room for is a story this long, and the meeting lasts for two hours, there's no way, in the, no way you're going to get all that information in there. So then you only look for the one or two most important things that they've talked about. But it depends. Always talk to your editors, your bosses beforehand. Try to find out what's needed. How much time am I going to have for my presentation once I'm on camera? You know, will it just be a 30-second spot or will it be two minutes? You know, it depends. So, but look for the, mo the most important thing and then the second most important thing. And you can learn after you cover something for a while, you pretty much know how to rank news items. You raising your hand? No, okay, <laughs> I thought you were. Um, I think that's about all I have to say. After the meeting, if you might have to rush right out to get back to your station or your newspaper, but if you have time, it might be good to stick around, chat with people. After all, they're gonna meet again next month, and the, mo the more rapport you can build with the people involved in the regents or the city council or the county commissioner's office, the better chances you have of uh, developing a relationship with them. Covering a, uh, having a beat is a, a whole series of developing relationships. And again, here's where your reputation is so important. Uh, people have to trust you. Um, there's a story I heard once, and I know it to be true. I'm gonna have to change some of the facts because I can't remember them all clearly. But there was a reporter in Washington, D.C. at the Treasury Department who got a scoop. She got the scoop from a janitor who was going through someone's wastebasket and they found a damning document. Why did this reporter get the scoop and not the other reporters? Because when she came in in the morning, she would say to the janitor, to the secretaries, to everyone, hi, how are you? How's your wife? That sort of thing. Uh, a lot of reporters, especially when you get higher up the ladder, they tend to be kind of snobbish. They don't talk to janitors. They don't talk to secretaries. Well, I can tell you one thing. Secretaries know what's going on. They absolutely know what's going on. And these are the, perhaps the most important people to cultivate as sources of information. So, and you never know, a janitor. Who would have thought that a janitor might have this vital piece of information, this document? Maybe the janitor wasn't supposed to have it, but he did. And so be nice to people. Be nice to people and treat people as equals, which after all, we all are. Okay. And just because someone has a title CEO, that means something, but it certainly doesn't mean everything. Or if someone else has a title janitor, that means something too, but it doesn't mean everything. Okay, well, unless there are more questions or comments, I don't have, I don't think I have anything else to say about these two topics. 
I have some questions for you. Sure. See if you can get them right. Okay, I'll try my best. Um, you going up and talking to people after a meeting. Do you have your notebook out? Uh, I've, I've gone up and talked to people after a meeting and they're being very candid and then all of a sudden I pull out my notebook or I pull out my tape recorder and they stop talking to me pretty much or they become very guarded. Um, have you had that happen? Do you have ways to work around that or what's the story? Yeah, I will say something like, can I quote you on that? Or they might say, don't quote me on this, but blah, blah, blah. Um, you might just listen. I, when you pull out a notebook or a tape recorder, it sort of puts people on their guard. I try not to do that. Uh, and I, I gen generally won't, but I might listen very closely and say to myself, that was uh, Congressman Joe Blow who said that, and I've got to remember exactly what he said, because I want to check this out. Uh, but I wouldn't do that. I generally don't do that. If I already have my notebook out, uh, I, I told my classes that when I go to meetings, I have, uh, I don't have either one with me today, but there's reporter's notebooks that are little notebooks about this big. And then I also have a folder that I use for like when I cover the Board of Regents because I know I'm going to be sitting down and I can write longer. Um, and so at the end of a Regents meeting, I will have this folder with me that I could flip open if I want to, but I won't do it unless I know that the person speaking isn't going to be scared off by my doing it. I actually think having notebooks and or some sort of notebook is really good. I usually go through two or three notebooks a year on things, meetings that I have, not even as a reporter, just meetings. And I can usually say to my, and then I label the notebook when it's done and I put it on my shelf. And I can, I can say, well, two years ago, I remember I did that. And that was the orange notebook. And so having your own sort of filing system, I know you guys are, are super whizzes with computers compared to some of us, but um, having your own system and keeping the information you collected and being able to find it and access it, that's a huge thing. Start to develop a system right now for doing that. The journal, unlike every other paper I've ever worked at, the journal once a month collects all paper notes. And they put them in the archives. I don't know what they do with them. But every reporter once a month gets a big envelope with your name on it. And you're required to turn it in at the end of the month. That is, that's... Uh, and a lot of times you need this information. Stories can go on for months at a time. And you want to go back to look for phone numbers or whatever you might have scrawled down. And, but always. There's one rule, though, that's important, and that's either you save your notes or you don't save your notes. You cannot selectively save notes. And then, for example, if you called up for a congressional investigation and they say, well, where are your notes on matter A? And you say, oh, I don't have them. I threw them away. Well, why do you have notes on matter B, C, D, and E? The courts have ruled that you either have to get rid of all your notes or save all of your notes. So, I used to, I started getting rid of mine after a while when I was working in California. I think when you're first starting out, I think it's really good to be able to access a note you took a year ago. If yeah. you can do that, you will be able to find names and phone numbers. You'll be able to to uh, get in touch with people who you kind of vaguely remember when you talked to them and what they looked like. And if you have a system that lets you get that information without spending the whole day looking for it, uh, you'll just be better at getting information than other people. One thing uh, a lot of people disagree on is the use of a tape recorder. I used to have one. But I found that it was just too cumbersome to transcribe what was on the tape recorder onto paper. And so I stopped using it. It's probably still home in my desk. But 
covered with dust. But other people love tape recorders. They swear by them. So it's up to the, you know, up to the individual. You develop your own style. But it's good to uh, listen to what other people are doing, watch what other people are doing, how they go about their job. 